Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's so great to see you all here and to uh, welcome you to the beginning of the inaugural Hoover Education Summit. Uh, we hope this is the first of many to come. Uh, I will be telling you a little bit more about the program tomorrow when more people are here to join us. Uh, but the real focus of tonight is, is not about the summit. The focus of tonight is to welcome and uh, celebrate the leadership of Condoleezza Rice, particularly in the area of K-12 education policy and research. Uh, she is uh, a remarkable change agent in our midst, and I have the pleasure of introducing her before her remarks tonight. She, as you may know, is the Tad and Diane Toby Director of the Hoover Institution. She also serves as the Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow on Public Policy and is the founding partner of an international strategic consulting firm, Rice, Hadley, Gates, and Manuel, LLC. Uh, perhaps her best known accomplishment to date is that from January 2005 to January 2009, she served as the 66th Secretary of State of the United States under George W. Bush president. Uh, prior to that, she had roles on the National Security Council staff and was a special assistant to the president for national security affairs. Throughout her career, she has been active in leadership in both the private and public sectors. She currently serves on many, many boards, including the National Board of the Boys and Girls Club and the Aspen Institute. She is part of the Stanford community, and this is a, re a recurring theme that you're going to hear throughout the summit. Uh, Hoover and Stanford love to stake a claim on anybody they can, uh, and we are delighted to be able to claim a long-standing relationship at Stanford with Condoleezza. She's been on the faculty since 1981, and I think some of the graduate students here actually weren't born yet. So, uh, during her tenure, she won, she was awarded two university prizes for t excellence in teaching, and she continues active engagement with students. Uh, she has since she returned to campus after her public service and continues today. Uh, she served as provost, which is probably the least popular job on campus, uh, from 1993 to 1999. Um, our director has a BA in political science, cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa, from the University of Denver. She went to Notre Dame for her MA in political science and returned to the University of Denver for a PhD in political science from the Graduate School of International Studies. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and whoa, she's been awarded 15 honorary degrees. Uh, that's a lot of hats and gloves back in the, uh, in the closet. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to do as moderator of the summit uh, is I have asked each of the speakers to tell me something about them. And the something was, what was your guilty COVID pleasure? <laughs> now I know that most of you are gonna think her answer is golf, or potentially watching the very few football games that happened. It's not. I was shocked, I tell you I was shocked to learn she's become addicted to the family feud. With that, I would like to welcome Condoleezza Rice. Well, Mackie, there are no secrets between friends, and so uh, thanks very much for that introduction. I also just have to say, um, yes, I've been on the Stanford faculty since 1981. They hired me when I was 11, obviously. Uh, so, well, welcome. Welcome to Stanford, welcome to the Hoover Institution. I am so delighted that uh, we can gather here. First of all, I'm delighted that we can gather here. Let's be very clear about it. It's been a long time since we were able to do that. But I'm especially delighted that we can gather here to talk about what I consider to be uh, the most important issue uh, facing our country, facing the world, and that is the education of our children. Uh, a number of years ago, I served uh, for the Council on Foreign Relations of all organizations on a task force called National Security and Education Reform. 
Uh, my co-chair was Joel Klein, uh, who had just stepped down from his uh, New York City uh, position uh, in, in education. And uh, we did this because uh, we wanted people to understand that uh, the future of our country, whether it is our security, our prosperity, or indeed our social cohesion, all rests on being able to make certain that every child has access to a high quality education. It's important in any country, but I would submit to you that it's particularly important in the United States of America. Because if you were to have a conversation with the proverbial man from Mars, and he said, well, tell me about these Americans, you would say, well, you know, their ancestors have come from every corner of the globe. Uh, they aren't united by ethnicity or nationality or religion. And that man from Mars would say, well, that must be challenging. What unites them? And you would have to say, well, it's this creed, this belief that it doesn't matter where you came from, it matters where you're going. You can come from humble circumstances and you can do great things. And that's what unites them. It's what has brought their ancestors here and some of them from across the globe just to be a part of that. And it frankly didn't matter whether they came to make $5, not 50 cents, or people like Sergey Brin, whose parents brought him here from Russia at seven years old and he eventually found Google. They came because they believed that. And more importantly, those who are here understand that they are not prisoner of their class. You can start at the bottom rung of the ladder, and one day you can be CEO, or president, or university president. You can start at the bottom, and you can get to the top. And that's what unites them. But we all know that that is not true unless every child has access to a high quality education. Now I want you to understand that this is an article of faith in my family. I came from a family, uh, Birmingham, segregated Birmingham, Alabama, uh, left Alabama when I was 12. My parents were educators. My, my dad was a high school guidance counselor. My mom was a teacher. Eventually my dad would go on to be a university administrator. And in my little community, it was faith and family and education. Because education was your armor against whatever was going on around you. And this was an article of faith in my family because it went back uh, another generation to my grandfather, John Wesley Rice Sr. Maybe some of you have heard his story. Uh, John Wesley Rice Sr. was a sharecropper's son in Utah, this pool, it would be E-U-T-A-W, yes, I'm not kidding, Alabama. And um, when he was a young man, he decided he was gonna get book learning in a college. And his mother, who had been a freed slave, had taught him to read, and somehow he'd become very bookish. He cared about this thing called education and learning. And so he saved up his cotton. He asked uh, passersby how a colored man could go to college, and they said, well, you know, you could go to this little college called Stillman College. It's in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. That's not far from where you live, and they, they train colored men. So he went off to Tuscaloosa to Stillman College, and he paid for his first year, but then he ran out of money for his second year, and he, they said, well, you'll have to leave. And thinking quickly, he said, but how are those boys going to college? They said, well, you see, they have what's called a scholarship. And if you wanted to be a Presbyterian minister, you could have a scholarship too. <laughs> Granddaddy Rice said, that is exactly what I had in mind. And my family has been college educated and Presbyterian ever since. <laughs> now, John Wesley Rice understood that that education was going to open up horizons for him that he might otherwise never have seen. And he understood that it was gonna to matter to his family too. And indeed, my father would become college educated, advanced degree, and my Aunt Teresa, my Aunt Teresa would go to the University of Wisconsin in 1952. She would get a PhD in Victorian literature and write books on Dickens. You think what I do is weird for a black person? She wrote books on Dickens. Now, 
extraordinary in those days to have that love for education. But it was more than just a love of the intellect, a love of education. It was a fundamental understanding that education opens horizons that you would otherwise not have. And that's the way that we have to take on the challenge of educating every child. It is a national security priority. In the work that we did, we learned that only 30% of the people who take the basic skills test to get into the military can pass it. And we're not talking about higher math. For economic prosperity, as we look around the world and we look at where we stand among developed countries, we are not doing so well. And these days, when there are no really, truly unskilled jobs out there, this is an economy that will punish those who do not have skills. How would you like to try to get a job when you can't read? And we know that if by third grade you don't read, your chances aren't very good of reading. And it is a matter of social cohesion. That that creed had better be true. And so I can't think of anything more important than the work that you do and the work that you will do. I can't think of any more important effort here at Hoover than to conduct the research and analysis to understand the current quality of our schools, how to improve them, and determine whether those efforts have been successful. We have a track record of engagement, though, with those who can make it happen, whether they are policymakers at any level of government, whether they are those of you who have become activists in this field to represent the unrepresented and the voiceless. Whatever role you have played in education, we want to be supportive of it with the data, with the research, with the hopefully solutions to some of the hardest problems that we face. And so I am just delighted that we are able to do this education summit. Uh, Mackie, who has been uh, on point, you've done just a terrific job in bringing these folks together, but uh, Mackie and our education uh, folks have been at this for a long time, and Mackie um, is a, an exemplar of what it means to be a great scholar, but to have those connections to the people who are in the room where it happens. And so I'm delighted, and I want you to know that this is actually my first major summit. And I told Mackie and I told Chase and Stephanie, who uh, are my uh, chief of staff and deputy chief of staff, I want my first summit as director to be about education. And I'm so grateful that you're here with us tonight. Mackie, do you want to come up and join me? We're going to have a little conversation. Now, Mackie's going to get to ask the questions, and I choose whether to answer them. I forgot to put this opportunity out to bid, so I'm going to just have to take the questions as they come. Uh, there are microphones around the room. If anyone has a question that they would like to pose, please raise your hand, and we will make sure that you are presented with a microphone. Please wait until you have the microphone. And then as soon as you ask your question, please give up the microphone. <laughs> you have to ask a question or I will cold call on someone. The professor strikes again. Well, I will start off with a question if no one is ready to warm up. Um, Condi, this has been a remarkable time in American politics. We've seen great uh, polarization and uh, angry politicization of many issues. Uh, when you look forward to the work that, require, that we are required to do if we are to improve outcomes for kids across the country, what do we do about the incredible divisiveness in the political sphere? There is divisiveness in the political sphere, but I believe that we can come together around uh, a couple of principles, the most important of those principles, uh, that uh, everybody deserves a high quality education. 
And I do think that uh, in a polarized world, it's important to hear all sides, to hear from everyone. Uh, one reason that here at Hoover, we try very hard to do uh, data-oriented, uh, evidentiary-based research is that uh, too often our political debates these days are just that. They are political debates and they are data-free. Uh, they take place uh, with, uh, I actually see this sometimes with my students too, they will say, well, I think or I feel. And I say, um, you know, just because you think it or feel it doesn't make it so. And so to the degree that we can uh, arm uh, our uh, debate with, um, with real data, with research, then we can, we can debate outcomes, we can debate uh, what we wish to do, but what we shouldn't be debating is the facts uh, before us. And I think Hoover is a place that can sincerely help with that, and hopefully that helps with the polarization as we begin to move away from just it's my opinion, it's what I feel, to let's really look at what we know about this problem and see uh, then how we think about it uh, together. I would just add one point, which is that we are lucky uh, at Stanford to have a number of colleagues in other parts of the university who are similarly uh, committed to rigorous analysis of education issues through data. And so one of the things that we look forward to is also uh, building stronger partnerships within the university in order to uh, bring the best minds to the table to solve the problems that we're facing. I think we have a question here. Yes, thank you. I'm Holly Bofi. I serve on the State Board of Education in Louisiana. I'm also a principal of a high school in Louisiana. And um, when I was growing up, educators were valued in my family. Um, my grandparents were educators. And so I um, am really struggling now with the teacher shortage that we face and also with the fact that people are not interested in going into education. We see fewer people going into our teacher preparation programs. And I just have questions about what's it going to take uh, you know, what's going to be the, the tipping point to turn things around so that educators are truly respected um, and that we have the people we need going in because we know the number one in-school factor to our student outcomes is having strong teachers. Well, you're absolutely right about how teachers were respected. The little community that I grew up in in Birmingham is called Titusville, and I think everybody taught school. I think there was one lawyer, one doctor, and everybody else taught school. And the highest uh, station in life was to be a principal of a high school. Um, in fact, uh, kind of just an interesting little side fact, um, the principal of the largest black high school in Birmingham uh, was a man named R.C. Johnson. He was Alma Powell's father. And the uh, principal of the second largest was a man named George C. Bell, and she, he was Alma Paul Powell's uncle. So they had a bit of a, a, a franchise going there, but uh, you, everybody respected them. So why did they respect them? Uh, we have to re recognize that uh, the labor pools for teachers are different than they were in those days. When I think of the options that were there for uh, say black women or for that matter black men, uh, there weren't as many options as there are today. So how do you make the option uh, more attractive? Uh, the first thing is, I do think you appeal to, there are just an awful lot of people, I see them in Teach for America, I see them in uh, my kids who decide to go into teaching. There are people who just associate with the mission. They just really believe what we've been talking about, that every kid ought to have a high, high, uh, a, a high quality education and that they can have a role in that. And so when you look at anything that works that way, whether it's the military where you have a, a sense of mission, uh, we have to, again, have that sense of mission. Secondly, um, I started a program called the Center for a New Generation out in East Palo Alto and East Menlo Park back in 1992. And uh, there are now seven of them in the Bay Area. There's one in Atlanta, one in Dallas, and one in Birmingham. And they are uh, associated with the Boys and Girls Clubs. But we learned something very interesting. What we did was we actually hired teachers from the district to be the after-school teachers. And what they liked was the sense of creativity and flexibility in the classroom. And I sometimes wonder if we don't appeal enough to that part of teaching. 
Um, it, it, the degree to which there are you know, bureaucracies that sort of get in the way of uh, a teacher being more creative probably turns a lot of people off. And by the way, you were very nice to say that the most important thing is, is teachers because you are principal, but actually, I think the data show also that the quickest way to turn around a school is to get a good principal. And they, more than anything, also will say that they feel the constraints and weighed down by the kind of paperwork. So are there ways that we can, can uh, deal with that? Then third, I think we have a tendency with technology these days, uh, I've seen it, uh, to put technology in the classroom, but it isn't useful uh, because we really don't work on uh, the teacher training and the integration of the technology. So can we do better in that way so that people who are perhaps attracted because they want to do something that's kind of innovative, can we attract those people? And then finally, um, you know, I do think that um, respect for teachers uh, goes up when teachers are really uh, showing themselves to, uh, to the admission. I'm saddened by what happened during COVID. I wish that somehow teachers had declared themselves um, to be essential workers and found a way into the classroom in the way that uh, people found their way to uh, check groceries at Safeway. I think that could have done a lot. Um, and now we've got a little bit of, of remedial work to do in that regard. But I, I think that if you, if you make it uh, respected, but also innovative, creative, and attract those people, I think you may get better teachers in the classroom. I also am a big fan, by the way, of more mid-career entry into teaching uh, to the degree that credentialing, for instance, uh, gets in the way of people perhaps coming in mid-career. Uh, maybe it's the military officer who's had a 10-year career in the military. Maybe it's somebody uh, in uh, business who wants to come in. Uh, we have a lot of, of strange rules about who can teach. And um, I think it's not that you just want everybody in the t teaching, but you should really be looking at, uh, at broadening the, um, the notion of who can teach. Hi, my name is Bernita Bradley from Detroit. Um, wanted to ask the question, what role do you see parents playing as the first educator and um, them collaborating with schools to make sure that the future of our education is prosperous and equitable for our children? Yes. Well, you know, my whole life, um, it was parents need to be more involved in schools. Uh, I need the parents to be there uh, with me. Um, I, I had to stop my parents from going to school every day. You know, I would say, no, 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 I can handle that from the time I was about seven. You know, they wanted to go up uh, every time there was an issue. But uh, some, uh, what I am saddened by is that it uh, suddenly is being cast as adversarial between parents and teachers. Uh, I believe they each have their role to play and they each care about the students. So let's figure out how we do this collaboratively. Parents do need to know what their kids are being taught. Uh, you know, and they need to understand, they, they're gonna understand best the development of their child. Where is that child in their uh, emotional development and their psychological development? And so the idea that parents somehow would have no role in that I find odd. But teachers um, also have to be able to develop curriculum and teach it. I hope that we can uh, perhaps re-energize uh, again uh, the kinds of um, organizations like PTAs uh, that school by school, uh, really teachers get to know the parents and parents get to know the teachers and it becomes more collaborative. This isn't helping anybody that is becoming adversarial especially not helping the kids. Dr. Peterson. So um, I have two questions, uh, Condi. Uh, one that, that I really want to know the answer to, but I don't dare ask the question. And that is, um, I'm a Methodist. And uh, you talked about John Wesley. And I just don't, I really want to know why you're not a Methodist. <laughs> Because you know, the Methodists wouldn't, the Methodists wouldn't pay for my grand, my grandfather's education. That's it's very clear. <laughs> okay, uh, so the second question is: There's a lot of talk about the overeducated American, and in your uh, opening comments, you said that really, you know, education is for everyone, 
and we all need to aspire. And you, your examples are from the classics and the humanistic uh, tradition in education. Um, so, but there is a real feeling now among a broad segment of our population that we should be training people for sort of practical jobs that are out there. And I was just in Jordan, and there is a, in Jordan, there's actually a feeling that there are so many well-educated people that there really aren't enough jobs for them to fill. So I think this is not a, to be ignored, this idea, though I don't really share it myself, but how do you respond to that kind of uh, sentiment? Well, I, I am actually one who believes that not everybody uh, has to aspire to a four-year college degree. Uh, there are uh, certainly um, other alternatives, and we ought to uh, make them both um, accessible and respected. Because when did it become the case that working with your hands and having a trade was somehow uh, not respected in our society? So I have no problem with saying uh, if this person would rather go to, let's say, community college, and there's a two-year uh, program with uh, an apprenticeship at the end, and companies are doing this with community colleges, I think that's just fine. What I don't want to do, with all due respect to the Germans, who are wonderful, um, and by the way, I just have to say, the best line I've heard about what we're experiencing recently is that Vladimir Putin, within one week, ended German pacifism and Swiss neutrality. Uh, so, um, but, um, but people often talk about these European systems, or the German system in, in particular. Uh, even the Germans will tell you uh, that you have to be careful about tracking too early. And uh, what I worry about is that it will be the kids who don't have means or the kids who uh, don't come from families who value education who get tracked into, uh, quote, vocational education. But as a choice, as an option, I really think we need to do more uh, to develop it because uh, we do have to be responsive to a certain extent to the job market. Not, not everybody uh, should write books on Dickens like my aunt. I believe that uh, Mr. Finn over here was the uh, next person in line, but he does not have a microphone. Thanks. I'd like you to come back to adversarial and deal with the tension between excellence and equity, which has been a challenge for American education for as long as I've been alive. It's 60 years ago since John Gardner wrote a book entitled Excellence, and the subtitle was Can We Be Equal and Excellent Too? And it seems to me like that tension's gotten worse in recent years. Uh, what's your take on how to resolve this? Well, I'm with John Gardner. Uh, I don't see excellence and e equity or equality, let me say that, equality of opportunity as uh, opposed to one another. And I have to say, I find it sometimes a, a bit patronizing when people seem to suggest that uh, if you're going to have diversity, you're going to somehow have to sacrifice excellence. I, I, I don't think that's the message that we want to send. Uh, it's certainly not the message I want to send to the seven-year-old who is trying to figure out whether uh, he or she should study or maybe just wait for structural racism to be done with. Um, because if we make it so that there's no agency uh, in attaining excellence because the structural factors out there are so big you would never overcome them, what are we doing to, uh, to our children? So when I think about how we get to, uh, you choose your word, equity, equality, and to excellence, I do think about what might be the barriers to certain people achieving uh, excellence, and I want to work backwards to remove those barriers as early as I possibly can. So I don't want a child <clears throat> who grows up in a certain zip code to have an inferior education in first grade and then when they're in ninth or 10th grade, say, well, you know, I have to now scrimp on excellence because uh, I won't be able to, th this child will never have a chance. You know, if I'd intervened in first grade, that child might have been perfectly capable of excellence. And so I would reverse it. Let's decide what it takes to be excellent, and let's, re let's reverse engineer that 
to make it available to as many people as possible. Now, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, not everybody's going to be excellent. Uh, but can we at least try for a system in which we don't make that determination for people as to whether they can be excellent based on the color of their skin? I thought we spent 160 years trying to get out of that since the Civil War. And so um, I, I think we've really gone off the rails on this one. Um, and I just hate the messages that are out there uh, about, uh, about achievement. I believe Hannah Sheck was next. <laughs> you finally got in there, Rick. Yeah. Sorry, I had to push in. Um, it, let me talk a little bit about the future. And let me put it in the context of the work that you and Joel Klein did on national security. One argument about the U.S. military, I don't think there's any argument that the U.S. military is the most effective force in the world. Um, but one argument would be that we have the best technology. We have the best fighter planes and the best bombers and so forth. Um, what's the role of education in that? Can't we just substitute uh, advanced capital and advanced equipment for uh, an educated workforce? Right. Uh, I think any uh, general will tell you that, yes, we have the best technology and the best bombers and so forth and so on. But nothing substitutes for, uh, first of all, morale in, in, in the armed forces, and we're seeing that with the Russians uh, right now. Uh, nothing substitutes for being able to train people and train people. Uh, the, the problem with training in the military these days is it has to be adaptive. Uh, you don't train somebody and that lasts for the next 20 years. The technology is changing, the circumstances are changing. You really do want somebody to be educated and to be able to read so that you're not actually reading to them. That's why a lot of people don't pass the basic skills test. So I think the best generals will tell you that our technology cannot make up for the, uh, for the education of our soldiers and for their ability through their education, their analytic skills and so forth, to be able to adapt. Now they will tell you something I not always love, which is that actually because they all are gamers, uh, that they're actually pretty good <laughs> at some of the more advanced technology, even if they can't spell it. But uh, I think most generals would tell you that uh, the education, that, that having a soldier who can, uh, who is educated and can adapt is really very important to them. Uh, Dr. Rice, you cut your teeth during the Cold War. Um, you've often talked about school choice as the civil rights issue of our time. I mean, right at the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the modern school choice programs began, the Milwaukee voucher program, charter school laws. In, your estimation, should we be continuing to reform East Germany or should we be promoting West Germany's to flourish and tearing down the wall, so to speak? Well, I'd sure like to be tearing down the walls. Uh, it's not always, not always possible. Um, but um, look, I think the, the end of the Cold War um, presented us um, with what we thought was kind of permanent victory. And um, I was actually, from 1989 to 1991, I was the special assistant to President Bush for Soviet affairs. It kind of doesn't get better than being the special assistant for Soviet affairs at the end of the Cold War. <laughs> I was there for the unification of Germany. I was there for the liberation of Eastern Europe. I was there for, I left just before the peaceful collapse of the Soviet Union, but it was obvious that it was happening. And I remember, uh, not the hubris is not the right word, but the expectation that uh, as a friend of mine who actually is a fellow here at the Freeman Spogli Institute, uh, Frank Fukuyama wrote The End of History, that we'd resolved somehow this conflict of ideologies, ideologies uh, whatever civilizational conflicts there were, we'd resolved it. We'd resolved it in favor of free markets, We'd resolved it in favor of democracy. We had resolved it in favor of the liberal international order. And um, the idea that you, and, and then of course we had 9-11, but, but great power conflict, that was kind of a 19th century thing. And I think it led us at home uh, to 
perhaps be a little triumphalist at home as well. And to think that globalization was the answer not just to international peace, but to domestic prosperity. And those who were members of the kind of global elite, it worked pretty well. So that if I had a student in my class in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, I could be sure that there was to be a profile of the following. Born in Brazil, went to college at Oxford, first job was in Dubai, now in graduate school at Stanford, next job's going to be in Shanghai. And these people moved easily around the world. They spoke multiple languages. But there were a lot of people for whom the fact that they never moved more than 25 miles from where they lived. If you were an unemployed coal miner in West Virginia or an unemployed steel worker in, in Britain, this globalization thing didn't look too good. And then come along the populist who say, not only was the globalization not good for you, those elites don't respect you, they don't respect your values. Oh, by the way, uh, you're really a failure because you had privilege and you couldn't succeed. And now the populist comes along and says, follow me. Okay. Those institutions, they weren't made for you. Those elites, they don't respect you. And that's what you get. And so the combination of a kind of um, a expectation of prosperity and peace for all time abroad and an expectation that we sort of solve the problem at home too, led us to lose focus on a lot of the elements of what actually made people successful. And I think we're paying for that now. And uh, we've got to catch up. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to be catching up at home at the same time that we're going to have to re-engage abroad. And uh, whatever peace dividend there was, whatever uh, interlude from history there was, is now gone. And the really hard problem for America is, can we do both? Uh, can we both uh, take care of the multiple fissures and problems that we have at home, and still, uh, since we are the only country that can do it, stand for those values uh, abroad? It's going to be quite a challenge. So I think we have time for a couple more questions. Mr. Kleinhans, I think you had a question that you wanted to ask. Could we uh, get, a, get a microphone to him? Thank you. So um, earlier tonight, I had dinner with my um, granddaughter, who's not quite two years old, and her mother and father. And um, we sat down at the table, and she started to fuss. And my daughter pulled out her phone and, and put a little program up on her phone. and and Daisy started playing it. And when she got to the end of one of the sequences, she'd push the button and move the screen and 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 play, and she was fine. In fact, you were there. You saw how well she behaved during dinner. Um, anyway, it's just, it's so intuitive to me that um, that digitalization is has got to be a part of the solution to teaching. Kids are so, um, they, they pick it up so quickly. It's such a part of what they do. How do you balance that, that kind of that movement toward digitalization with the idea that teachers and principals are so important in the process, and how do you how do you integrate the two, um, um, or do you, or do you just move toward straight digitalization and, and let them be on a computer all morning and then let the teachers come in in the afternoon? Well, I think we've just had uh, John a little bit of an experiment with that, a little bit of a controlled experiment with that, uh, where basically that's kind of what we did during COVID. And um, kids didn't love it. Um, I don't think they felt they learned as well. And so I think the answer that we get from this controlled experiment that we didn't intend, but kind of was foisted us, upon us is, we've got, to, we've got to find that integration that you talk about. We've got to make technology a tool for good teaching um, not the end all and be all, uh, not an end in itself, let me put it that way. And uh, there are so many possibilities with technology. You know, I think about um, what if I had had um, paced, self paced learning in geometry? 
I might actually know something today about geometry. Uh, I was actually really good at algebra, really good at calculus. Geometry was a mystery to me. And yet, I had to go along with everybody else uh, at, and so this kind of self-pacing that you might be able to do, uh, that you stay with something until you actually understand it before moving on to the next. And I think there are all kinds of ways that technology might help. One thing we've got to do, by the way, is that um, we, finally, I think we might get broadband uh, to everybody, but uh, I was talking to people in one state and 40% of their residents didn't have access to it. Uh, that's kind of like not having access to electricity these days. And so, do we have the infrastructure? Then, do we have the uh, ways to creatively teach uh, or train teachers to use the technology? And do we have uh, a sense of how those two go together? So, I think the you know the answer is we've got to find the the integration. Um, I'm not smart enough to know exactly how that works. Uh, I don't particularly want people just sort of imposing it. I would really love to see some experimentation with it. I'd like to see teachers uh, feel free to, to use it in uh, different, different ways and get to best practices in the use of technology. But we absolutely can't leave technology on the sidelines, but we can't leave teachers on the sidelines either. Last question. Uh, Mr. Schneider, you're in line, but do you want to sell your rights? <laughs> this, well, there are a number of other people here who do want to ask a question, but I'm offering you the microphone in case you'd like to take your chat. <laughs> so uh, I'm Mark Schneider. I'm the director of the Institute of Education Sciences in the U.S. Department of Education. So we are one of the largest investors in education research and education sciences probably in the world. Um, and uh, I'm often asked, like, what keeps you up at night? And there's so much bad news about education that if, it, if I took that question seriously and the answer, I would be even worse insomniac than I am. <laughs> so, uh, so, for example, when the National Assessment of Education Progress came out for science, 67% of black 12th graders are below basic in science, 56% of Hispanic students are below basic in science, and 46% of all students in 12th grade are below basic in science. And we talk about the need for a diverse, strong, large STEM workforce, and we have numbers like this. That kept me up for a while. Yeah. But the thing that keeps me up the longest is the following. So you talked earlier about the importance of evidence, and, and that's what we exist for. We exist to uncover evidence about what works. So we have spent probably a billion dollars by institute alone on reading sciences, right? We have the best science. We have the best science about almost any education process in, that goes on about reading, right? We have fMRIs, we have cognitive science, we have all this. And despite all that, we, two things happen. One is that reading scores are perfectly flat, right? We made some movements early on and they're perfectly flat. And the other thing is, we know that the education of teachers is, shall we say at best, bifurcated, right? That some teachers are taught the science of reading, but many, many, many teachers are taught crazy th theories about education, about reading science, not at all, actually. They're taught that if you surround people with books, little kids with books, they learn to love reading, and we don't have to worry about things like phonics and things like that. And, we, and, and we've looked at the curriculum in schools of education, the way teachers are trained. We've gone out and talked to how teachers are teaching reading. And all the evidence that we have is all too often ignored. So the, the, the problem that we have with reading, the fact that we've spent over a billion dollars, NSF has spent equal amount of money, and we have not budged the, the needle in reading, Again, if, if things kept me up at night, that w that's one of the things that I find the most problematic. Right. <laughs> uh, well, was there a question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, sometimes you have to keep taking swings at bat, I guess. Uh, look, just because you have the data and just because you have the evidence, you're not going to carry the day. I worked in government, right? <laughs> and the U.S. government left to its own devices, will operate data free. And so you have to make sure that the people who are actually capable of making those decisions and who are on the front lines are both armed with the data 
and that they can get to a place where they can use it in a way that actually helps them carry the day and carry the argument. We were talking about my good friend Margaret Spellings, uh, who was uh, the, um, the domestic advisor when I was national security advisor. And, uh, you know, they knew what they needed to do. They had all of the data about how to think about what became No Child Left Behind. But it was a combination of the arguments and the evidence and the data and just hard scrabble political work that actually got No Child Left Behind to have Teddy Kennedy and George Bush on the same plate. Now, Teddy Kennedy and George W. Bush also tried to do immigration reform. They couldn't do it. So, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes we don't want, you know, at a place like Hoover, we're 501c3. We don't do politics, right? But there are people who do, and we want to influence those who do, and we want to arm them, but we understand that those of us who do the research and do the data and say, why don't you listen to our data, sometimes don't understand where they live. We maybe don't understand why in some rural parts of some states, it's really hard to make a choice argument. It, we were, I was talking to somebody about this today, you know, what private school in a rural, rural, rural district? And so sometimes I think those of us who have the data and have the research are not willing to try to put ourselves in the shoes of those who have to make it work. That's why I love the fact that uh, Mackey has put together practitioner councils. Right? These are the people who are on the front lines. And maybe they can teach us as much as we can teach them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner, and I'll be back to close you out in a while.